the crowds are back. A fraction of the usual numbers, but for the first time in more than a year, thousands head to Wembley Stadium. Super excited. It's been so long since we've last been, so can't wait. Can't wait. Glad to be back yeah. watching football again. <laughs> <laughs> Also tonight, the Salisbury Novichok poisoning suspects are being linked to an arms depot explosion in the Czech Republic. While flags return to full mast, the royal family remains in mourning after Prince Philip's funeral. And football chiefs across Europe issue a joint plea for England's top clubs not to join a breakaway Super League. ITV News with Kylie Pentelow. Good evening. For the first time in over a year, thousands of spectators are back in Wembley Stadium as the government ramps up plans for a return to live entertainment after COVID. The FA Cup semi-final between Leicester City and Southampton kicked off a moment ago in front of a crowd of 4,000. Everyone in the stands has had to provide a negative COVID test in order to secure their ticket. The first concert has also been added to the list of pilot events. Fans will be able to enjoy the gig at a Liverpool park in early May without masks or social distancing, as John Ray now reports. 4,000 fans in a stadium built for the big occasion barely counts as a crowd. But tonight's FA Cup semi-final from Wembley is a landmark moment in the slow journey out of lockdown. Super excited. It's been so long since Very we've last been, time. so can't wait. Can't wait. Glad to be back yeah. watching football again. <laughs> <laughs> Awarded tickets and a ballot of local residents and key workers supporters are part of a real-time experiment. Anna Chapman and her friend had to prove their virus-free status and they'll both do a second test in the days after the game. It feels, if I'm honest, really weird. There is definitely a lot riding it because obviously it's the first one, first game back for a while. So we've got 4,000 of us going in just testing out how an event or slowly getting the numbers back in the stadium. So I think it will go well. I think it, they're going to make it as smooth as possible. They're obviously not going to try and mess anything up on purpose. So I'm, I'm really, like I said before, I'm really looking forward to it. If all goes to plan, 8,000 fans will be allowed into the Carabao Cup final and 21,000, still less than a quarter of Wembley's capacity for the FA Cup final. And for the first time in a long time, 5,000 people with no social distancing will attend an open air concert in Liverpool next month. Music to the ears of gig goers everywhere, and not just to fans of headline act, The Blossoms. But no one will be watching more closely than the country's scientists. I think because it's a carefully controlled study, um, the people who are taking part know that there are risks associated with that. You know, this is not risk free. I think if anything goes wrong, uh, they will press pause. Uh, but I hope that that's not the case and people can feel reassured. Back at Wembley, the return to of that much missed ritual, the pre-match pint. But the result that matters most tonight and from the fixtures ahead isn't on the pitch but in the laboratories where samples will be tested to determine whether COVID can be confined, even in a crowd. John Ray, ITV News. The two Russian men suspected of carrying out the Salisbury poisonings have now been linked to an explosion at an arms depot in the Czech Republic in 2014. The Czech Organised Crime Unit published photographs as two foreign citizens who were using Russian passports. They were identified as Alexander Petrov and Ruslan Bosharov. They were suspected of being behind the Novichok poisoning of former Russian spy Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia in 2018. Mark McQuillan reports. These two men will be familiar to many, suspected of carrying out the Salisbury poisonings, which led to a major investigation in the city in 2018. They are now being linked to a separate attack in the Czech Republic. Authorities there are hunting the pair in relation to an explosion at an arms depot in 2014, which killed two people. At the time, it was thought to have been an accident, but after an exhaustive investigation, they are laying the blame at Russia after what they've described as unequivocal evidence. 
The Czechs decided to call out Moscow because they had had enough, according to this analyst. The Russian political war against the West has flared out once more. Mark Galliotti believes the explosive device in this case may have gone off prematurely, and this could well have been about a separate dispute. This was in 2014, at a time when basically Russia and Ukraine were at undeclared war over the southeastern Donbass region. And there were also a series of unexplained explosions of Ukrainian arms depots. So it seems most likely that this was essentially an attempt to deprive the Ukrainians of much needed munitions for their war effort. The Czechs have acted decisively, announcing they are expelling 18 Russian diplomats. A similar start to the one Britain took following the 2018 attack in Salisbury. These two men are now being linked to a separate incident four years earlier, leading to some suggestions of a lengthy covert campaign by Moscow and its GRU intelligence unit. Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab has reacted to developments by saying the UK stands in full support of our Czech allies who have exposed the lengths that the GRU will go to in their attempts to conduct dangerous and malign operations and highlights a disturbing pattern of behaviour following the attack in Salisbury. Russia has said these latest claims are unfounded, but the questions surrounding Moscow's conduct are not going away nor are those focused on what the West can effectively do in response. Mark McQuillan, ITV News. The official period of national mourning for the Duke of Edinburgh ended at 8 o'clock this morning, with flags on government buildings and royal palaces returned to full mast. It follows his funeral in Windsor yesterday, which was full of personal touches planned by Prince Philip himself. The royal family will continue their period of mourning until Thursday. Our royal editor Chris Ship is in Windsor for us this evening. Chris, a time for reflection now after a difficult day. Yeah, yesterday was uh, very difficult uh, for the Queen. I think sometimes it's only in the days after a funeral that the enormity of what has happened uh, can hit you. And I think anyone who watched yesterday will have noticed just what a lonely figure uh, the Queen looked sitting in St George's Chapel because she didn't have her own support bubble around her. Her other members of the family were in uh, their bubbles. So I think if the royal family, as they are, are in royal mourning this week, that means no engagements, no visits, nothing will happen. It means they can do as they have planned they will do, which, to, which is to look after the Queen uh, and rally round her. And I think the other takeaway from yesterday's uh, funeral was what will happen now with William and Harry. I mean, Harry is still in the UK, as we understand it. In fact, Frogmore House is just to my left over here, uh, Frogmore Cottage, sorry, where he uh, lived with Meghan and is currently staying with uh, Princess Eugenie and Jack Brooksbank. And uh, I think it's over the coming days uh, that we will find out whether or not his relationship with Prince William, which has been so terrible over the past year, uh, might have taken a step towards being healed uh, now that they've had that uh, funeral with, uh, as they did together yesterday. So, I mean, you look at what's happened over the past week, it's, it's been a, a pretty, um, it's been a pretty enormous uh, occasion here. Um, but I think most people hope that some good may come out of what's happened. Chris Shepard Windsor, thank you very much. The Environment Secretary has defended what he says are the robust systems already in place around lobbying. George Eustace said some tweaks may be needed, but existing rules are already pretty good. Well, his comments come after it emerged that David Cameron approached serving ministers and civil servants by text and email on behalf of the finance firm Greensill Capital. Our political correspondent Carl Dinan has more. You might think the boundary between what ministers do in office and any business they do afterwards should be clear. But David Cameron's work for Greensill Capital has shown otherwise. Today, Mr Cameron's former press officer, now the Environment Secretary, offered a partial defence of what his old boss had done. Does that pass the smell test? Does that look good? There are rules in place that David Cameron himself put in place, which is that ministers on leaving office shouldn't take such roles for a period of two years. I mean, he did leave office five years ago, so on the face of it, he hasn't done anything wrong, but he concedes himself that, you know, perhaps he, he should have written through formal channels just because of the perception. But more of Mr Cameron's lobbying has emerged. The Sunday Times publishing an email from him to a senior NHS official, Matthew Gould. He requests data for a payment service Greensill was offering the NHS on this occasion without charge. 
He signs off, finally and importantly, once this is all over, it would be great to see you again. Maybe for lunch. Let's stay in touch. Does that really make any difference if an ex-Prime Minister is emailing to offer a free service to the NHS? What we've seen this week is that Tory sleaze is back and it's bigger than ever. And David Cameron, at the height of the pandemic, was acting not in the national interest, but in his own private interest, looking to secure tens of millions of pounds through a series of share options. And he was exploiting every contact he had. Senior Tories are concerned about the impact on their support in places like Lee in Greater Manchester, won from Labour in 2019. It bothers me that there's this kind of fluid situation between politics and consultants where they can then lobby very easily and go outside of the usual channels. Well, it's taking advantage of your position really, isn't it? If you are not in power, you should not abuse the power using, you know, your contacts to, you know, gain something. Many people might not be that aware of David Cameron's work around the world for Lex Greensill, but that could change as both men may well end up giving evidence to Parliament. Carl Dinan, ITV News. The billionaire brothers who bought supermarket chain Asda earlier this year have added Leon to their business empire. A deal includes all 42 of the fast food firm's restaurants across the UK. It's the latest acquisition for Mason and Zuba Issa, the entrepreneurs from Blackburn, who made their fortune through petrol stations. Rumours that the top football clubs in England, Spain and Italy are considering their own breakaway competition seem to be reaching fever pitch this evening. Football associations across Europe have issued a joint statement condemning plans for the so-called European Super League, calling it a cynical project founded on self-interest. The Premier League has warned a new closed competition would destroy the dream of fans that any team can climb to the top. Chris Scudder reports. The news of a potential breakaway by Europe's elite clubs will send shockwaves through the major leagues across Europe. The game's governing body, UEFA, is reported to be furious. Only this week, UEFA's leading competition, the Champions League, reached the semi-final stage. Tomorrow, it's due to announce plans to expand that competition to involve more clubs. But some of Europe's elite, including up to half a dozen English clubs, have long been rumoured to favour an alternative, smaller competition in which they would be permanent members in a 20-team Super League. More money for them, less for the rest. Reaction has been swift and unequivocal. UEFA, the FA, Premier League and Spanish and Italian leagues, whose clubs are all reported to be involved, have tonight released a statement saying... All our associations remain united in our efforts to stop this cynical project, a project that is founded on the self-interest of a few clubs at a time when society needs solidarity more than ever. This would be effectively a franchise rather than a football league because it would be uh, based on invitation rather than sporting achievement. Reports of a breakaway have been circulating for months. Earlier today, the Premier League wrote to clubs, reminding them that its rules prevent them joining competitions without its approval. If the clubs involved decide to press on regardless, a lengthy battle in the courts looks inevitable. Chris Scudder, ITV News. Well, in today's sport, there was a goalless first half at Old Trafford where Man United faced Burnley. The action picked up straight after the break with this, the first of two goals for the hosts by Mason Greenwood. The final score there, 3-1. It was a more dramatic conclusion to Arsenal's face-off with Fulham. Fulham looked all set to go home with three much-needed points after Josh Matcher's second-half penalty. That was until Eddie and Ketia scored a 97-minute equaliser, damaging dreams for Fulham fans of Premier League survival. And finally, to the calm Florida waters where beachgoers suddenly found themselves in the path of a plane's crash landing. Well, this was the moment the World War II aircraft came down on Cocoa Beach. It was taking part in an air show over the coast when it suffered a mechanical failure. And despite skimming so close to unsuspecting swimmers, remarkably, no one was hurt. And that's it for now. The weather is next, followed by the news where you are. I'll be back the late news at a quarter to 11. Until then, whatever you're doing, enjoy your evening. Bye for now.